Good morning, friends, as we prepare and gather ourselves for worship. I invite you to hear the word of the Lord from Romans chapter 14, verse 8. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Welcome to this time of worship. I trust that as we gather virtually, that God will speak to you through the scriptures we use, memories of time together in worship, that the Spirit would infuse your imagination and cause your heart to draw close to God. Friends, as we, the people of God, gather, we repent of our sin, and we long to see the revelation of God's kingdom fully revealed in our world. And so, in the meantime, we practice the values of the kingdom, compassion, mercy, grace, the love of neighbor, and loving God with all that we are. We seek to follow the example of Jesus in everything that we do. We seek to be Christ-like in our actions and our thoughts. We seek to display the kingdom in our words and our actions. While we are apart, we pray for one another. We lift one another in prayer. We ask for healing. We ask for hope. We ask for grace. We trust that God's love for us is greater than the separation that we face because of the coronavirus, and that our God will still tie us together by the bonds of love, which are greater and more powerful than any virus. In the meantime, we wait. We anticipate a time of reunion and fellowship when we will worship together again. But it is a pale shadow of the true reunion we wait for when the kingdom of God is fully revealed and all God's people are gathered. Pray with me as we begin, please. Lord, as we gather in your name, as we seek your presence and your guidance, we want to worship you in spirit and truth. So we seek your aid in this quest. We we want to worship your right. We want to honor your name, not only with our words, but with the actions starting today and moving through the coming week. So we ask that you will make yourself known to us in this time of worship. Remind us of the scriptures we have read, the lessons we have learned, the songs we have sung. Let your spirit enliven our hearts, fill our minds, and strengthen us for the service to you and to the kingdom. We ask this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our first reading for this morning comes from John 3, 16 through 18. These are words you know. Feel free to recite them along with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his world, Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Friends, as we prepare ourselves for worship, realize we come and gather in the presence of the Almighty God, our Heavenly Father. And we give thanks for the great benefits we have received from his hand. And we come to offer worthy praise. We come to hear the holy word. We come to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things that are necessary for life and salvation. And so to prepare ourselves in heart and mind to worship, we do so with penitent hearts and obedient hearts. We confess our sins that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy. So friends, I invite you to a time of silence to repent and to speak to God about those, those things that are on your heart that would block or separate us from God. We'll hold a time of silence.
The Almighty and the merciful God, our Lord, forgives us all our sin. True repentance and amendment of life, the grace and the consolation of the Holy Spirit, God gives to us. Amen. Friends, as we think about life and faith this morning, there are several passages of Scripture I'd like to share with you just to deepen our understanding of what it means for us to be with in union with Christ. So the first comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. This is one that's often read at the graveside. Yet I invite you to hear it for the hope that it brings. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who have fallen asleep, that you may not grieve as others do with no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring those who have fallen asleep. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have fallen asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Christ Jesus, God will bring those who have fallen asleep. From Matthew 10, 28. Do not fear those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both the body and the soul in hell. Again, do not fear those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear whom, him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. From 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 57. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and the mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then the saying, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the last trumpet will sound, and the dead shall be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed, for the perishable body must put on imperishable, and the mortal body must put on immortality. And when the perishable puts on imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? From Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depths, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. didn't mean to create a, a morbid theme in our worship this morning, but we are dealing with Jesus' death. And death is very much a part of the world in which we live. We have all lost loved ones. We have all mourned. We have all grieved. Our nation is in the midst of a pandemic. 
Many lives have been lost and many more likely will. Death is something we need to talk about. Jesus' death is at a certain point an odd thought. The God, the very God who spoke the universe into being, who then entered into that universe as an infant, has been killed, executed as a rebel, an insurrectionist, not a freedom fighter, not a revolutionary in the sense of a Marxist or a communist or a North American colonial revolutionary. It wasn't about taxation and representation or economic models or systems of government. It was about breaching the gap between God and humanity, reconciling God to humanity. And this Jesus, the deity who brought us into being, is killed on a Roman cross in a backwater province known for troublemakers. And this is where he died. Hung on a cross between two insurrectionists who just wanted to be rid of the Romans. And there Jesus died. Matthew 27, verses 45 through 66 tell the story of Jesus' death. Listen to the words. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness covered the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran to get a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split. The tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tomb after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Many women were there, watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb, which he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to, the, to Pilate. They said, we remember that while he was still alive, the deceiver said, After three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day, otherwise his disciples will come and steal the body and tell the people that he is, risen, he is raised from the dead. The last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go and make sure the tomb is secure as you know how. And so they went made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. Pray with me, please. Lord, as we look at the text, as we read the words, we are struck by the finality of it all. Jesus has died. 
It doesn't seem right. It's unjust. It's wrong. And yet we know it purchases our own life and our salvation. The innocent dying for the guilty that we might be forgiven is a powerful thing. Lord, forgive us our sin. Forgive us for making you do this. Thank you for saving us. Amen. Let's look at some of the details, shall we? From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness covered the land of Judea. To what extent, it's hard to say. Where the actual boundaries of that darkness fell, I can't say. And I'll be honest, when I, I first started thinking about this, my, my mind initially jumped to the notion of an eclipse, a solar eclipse. Would that be a powerful way to tell this story that at precisely the time that Jesus is on the cross, a solar eclipse moved through and brought darkness. And they have created programs that allow you to run the clock, the astronomical clock, forward and backward and see when things would have happened and where. I didn't actually use one of those. I just looked at work that other people had done, I'll be honest. Um, but here's the problem. There was no eclipse of the sun on the day that Jesus died. In the year that Jesus died, there was no solar eclipse visible in Jerusalem. In fact, not just in the year 33 or 32 or 31 or 30, in that 10 year span, in the spring of the year, you can't find a single solar eclipse that moves through Jerusalem. Additionally, I found that there's a problem. An eclipse only happens when the moon is new. You can barely even see that thin sliver of the moon. When the moon is full, it's fully illuminated by the sun. It's in the opposite part of the sky. But what does that have to do with this? Well, you see, Passover is tied to the full moon not to the new moon. So at the time of Passover, you will never find a solar eclipse. So what does that tell us? It tells us that the darkness that covered the land at the time when Jesus was on the cross had nothing to do with the solar eclipse. There is no handy naturalistic explanation for the darkness. What does that mean? That means what happened, what caused the darkness, was something that God did. It was extraordinary. It was not natural. It was not normal. It is something beyond that. Exactly what I can't say. But it resonates with what we hear in John chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. In him, meaning Jesus, was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness is not overcome it. Does that tell us? Jesus is the light, and we just attempted to extinguish that light. The light's gone. Darkness covers the land. It's a potent example of what's going on here. It was not natural, but it was very much tied to Jesus' death. It, like his death, is a sign that those who can understand will look and see that God is active. Sometime around noon, Jesus was nailed to the cross. I say sometime. There were clocks in the ancient world, but nothing like we use today. Nothing with that precision. You couldn't check your wristwatch. You couldn't look at your phone and find out exactly what time it was. It was typically taken from looking at the position of the sun in the sky. Sometime around noon, Jesus was nailed to the cross. The third hour, well, not three hours from then, Jesus cried out 
Eli Eli Lama Sabachthani. The text includes a parenth parenthetical notation here giving us a translation for these Aramaic words. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus spoke Aramaic at this point. The language that was mostly used in the region, not just in Judea, but in, in the larger region where Judea is located at this point. The most common language used was Aramaic. The language that Jesus spoke here was not Hebrew, which is a closely related language, but he spoke Aramaic. Jesus used something very specific. This is a direct quotation from Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? Jesus quotes a well-known psalm, one that people there would have recognized with those few words. Just in the same way that I can say, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you know exact. I don't even have to say that much. And you know I'm talking about Psalm 23. It's a, a literary reference we know and understand. We, we get the imagery. And this is true here as well. This, this is a cry to God because Jesus is bearing the sin of the world. Your sin, my sin. That guilt. The sinless has now just taken on that burden. And that psalm, it speaks of themes of rejection, being surrounded by enemies, about being brought low. Jesus knew exactly where he was pointing us with this reference. I think the other thing that we should note is that for Jesus, the psalms were part of his life and prayer. It's an amazing little insight. We know that Jesus prayed. We know that he would go out early in the morning and pray before everyone else was around. And we know that he also prayed the Psalms. This little prayer uttered here is one example. This caused reaction in those who are watching. Verses 47 through 50 read like this. When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran, got a sponge, filled it with wine vinegar, and put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. He's calling Elijah. Those who heard him cry out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, their first thought is, he's calling Elijah. The events of the day are not lost on these people. The darkness, the things that are taking place, oh, they note it. Doesn't mean they draw the correct conclusions. Their first thought was that the prophet Elijah may be coming. The prophet Elijah is one of those few people in biblical history where there is no mention of his death. Enoch, for example, walked with God and then he was no more. Elijah is taken up into heaven in a chariot of fire. From 2 Kings chapter 2, beginning in verse 11, as they were walking along together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elijah saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elijah saw him no more. Then he took hold of his garment and tore it in two. Elijah and Enoch, these two figures that we know have no mention of their death, along with Melchizedek, who also is given that status. But why, why would they think he's calling Elijah for help? Elijah is this figure who is tied to the end of days. 
the one who comes to prepare the way. They miss this in John the Baptist, the one who came as an Elijah. But even today, it's common to leave a place for Elijah at Passover. It's a figure of faith and legend. And there is fear in saying this. And some who are present may have wondered if they just killed the Messiah. Of those who are watching, one of them, likely a follower of Jesus, or someone who was scared into thinking he should act, does something. He brings Jesus a drink, a sponge filled with wine vinegar on a staff that he could drink. It doesn't seem that this would be a kindness the Romans would do, but it's wine vinegar. This is the standard drink of the poor and the soldiers. And someone else said, leave him alone. Let's see what happens. Let's see if Elijah will come to save him. But as we know, Elijah didn't come. If he would have, if he would have come in if he would have came and brought Jesus down from the cross and saved him, then we, you and I, we'd be lost. And then a very strange thing that happened. Three hours into what should have been a three-day execution, Jesus died. Verse 50 says, and when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. Jesus died. And then things began to happen. At that moment, Matthew says, verse 51, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. The earth shook. Rocks split, and tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people had been raised to life. They came out of their tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. The curtain of the temple is torn in two from the top to the bottom. A very interesting bit of information. The curtain separated the Holy of Holies from the Holy Place. The Holy Place, the Holy of Holies, was considered so sacred that the high priest only entered once a year and then to make an offering. Legend holds that a rope was tied around his waist in case that he was struck down by God while he was in there so they could pull him out and not have to go in after the body. It was not a place where people were tolerated to go. And if you went when you weren't supposed to, it was upon pain of death. It was a wall separating man and God. But what are we told? We're told that this dividing line, this symbol of separation, is torn in two, from the top to the bottom. Not the action of men trying to reach God, but the action of God taking the wall down. It's a symbol of Jesus' death on the cross bringing about a reconciliation of humanity to God. It is God saving us. The earth shook and rocks split. The immovable were moved. Faith has moved a mountain. Tombs open. And on the resurrection, the holy dead would rise from their graves and go into the city. We see this here in the midst of the description of Jesus' death. Hope that this isn't over, it's not done. This doesn't signify the end of the hope of the Messiah. In fact, it's just the opposite. With Jesus' resurrection comes the resurrection of others. There is hope in the darkness. 
Some saw the things unfolding in front of them, and they, they understood that something profound had taken place. Verse 54 says very briefly, When the centurion and those with him were, who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake, and all that happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Friends, I don't know if that Roman soldier, that leader of the execution squad, most likely a hard man, a battle-hardened soldier who has done gruesome work. He looked at all this that transpired on his watch, and he and his men were terrified. And his conclusion was, surely this man is the Son of God. A Gentile executioner tells us Jesus is the Son of God. From here, the tone of the text changes. It moves in some different ways. We get details that are important for the, the larger story, but they're almost a postscript to what the, the Gentile, the Roman centurion says. Verse 55 and 56. Many women were there, watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. A short list of women who have been present with Jesus since the days in Galilee. Not a complete list, it's a partial one. It includes Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. These three women particularly are mentioned. The list varies depending on which gospel you're reading from at what time. But we see women present at the crucifixion, and it will be women who are present at the resurrection. Not Jesus' disciples, not the twelve. No. It's this group of women who follow Jesus. Verse 57 gives us some more detail about how the, the day wraps up. In verse 57 on through 61, as evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. You know, we've read about Joseph of Arimathea, and there's some great stories about Joseph. Oh, he's tied to Arthurian legend and to uh, the land of England. But what do we really know about him? Not a lot. We know at some point he became a disciple of Jesus. We know he was a rich man of some means, who was in Jerusalem for Passover. Whether he saw Jesus for the first time here or not, I can't say. But he also had enough influence and power and recognition that he could get an audience with Pilate. He went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. This doesn't sound like a big part of the story, but it's a very important thing to note. Had one of the disciples, like Peter, James, or John, tried to get a, an audience with Pilate, it likely wouldn't have happened. Joseph may well have been a member of the Sanhedrin and been well respected, or it may have simply been his wealth that purchased his way in to see Pilate. Pilate is known for being bribed and accepting money to a assist in making decisions. 
I'm not saying that happened here. But Joseph of Arimathea, not a native of Jerusalem, had enough influence to see Pilate that day. And for Pilate to say, yes, you can take the body. Joseph took the body, he wrapped it in clean linen cloth, prepared it for burial, and put it in a tomb that he had prepared for himself. He then rolled a large stone in front of the entrance, and he went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. They watched. They knew what happened. They knew where Jesus' body was buried. They were witnesses. This will be important later, but they know the tomb. The next bit, the last we'll be looking at today, is rather interesting. Picking up in verse 62, the next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, the deceiver, meaning Jesus, said, after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise his disciples may come and steal the body and tell people that he has been raised from the dead. The last deception will be worse than the first. They've tagged him now a deceiver. In truth, they were the ones who deceived. These members of the Sanhedrin, leaders of the populace in Judea, Sadducees and Pharisees went to speak with Pilate. They said, we remember that while he was still alive, the deceiver, this Jesus guy, so then the third day he would rise. So they said to Pilate, order the tomb to be secured. So Pilate said, take a guard go and make the tomb as secure as you know how so they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting a guard now these are not temple guards these are not random people who have been assigned the job of watching over the tomb these are Roman soldiers they are battle hardened they know their job they are going to make sure that this place is secure. There will be men watching it round the clock. They will guard the tomb. No one's going to come in and take the body out. The Sanhedrin is seeking, or those members of the Sanhedrin who are involved, are seeking to make sure that they've got all their bases covered. They have made plans to keep the story of Jesus in the tomb. But friends, we know the end of the story. It doesn't end in the tomb because of resurrection. Pray with me, please. Lord, we know the end of the story. We know that resurrection is coming. We know that death is not the final word, not for Jesus and not for ourselves. That resurrection is the reality. And that death has already been defeated. So Lord, we, we give thanks for the story of Jesus' empty tomb. And we look forward to that time when the kingdom is fully revealed and we are gathered again beyond the scope of this pandemic beyond the scope of life and death and all the people of God are gathered in the kingdom for this great reunion 
and we will know the saints and we will know as we are known and we will be in your presence Lord prepare us for that day we ask this now in Jesus name Amen friends we want to continue to keep those who have had less than robust health in our prayers we all know some people who are suffering from one or another issue uh, in particular we want to keep Owen and Lou in our prayers we want to keep John and Janet in our prayers we want to keep Edie in our prayers and Sandra and Shirley um, Pat's friend Jean whose treatments are progressing we want to continue to keep Helen and the rest of the faithful in our prayers a regular part of our our daily time with God we we share this load together and we lift them up but we also want to remember those uh, who are sick with uh, COVID-19 we want to remember those who have lost loved ones through the pandemic those who have lost jobs through the pandemic those who continue to struggle with isolation and being physically distant from those that they love we would remember those who work in the front lines in our hospitals particularly in places where the the virus is seemingly out of control we've seen the reports in the news Lord and it's a bit scary we also remember um, those working in stores and businesses that are reopening Lord help to keep us safe and we, we just don't want we don't want to see things turn worse again here in our neighborhoods so we'll keep those things in our prayers we're going to remember our our missionaries Joanne Pat Benue Mick and Kathy we're going to remember our everybody's unspoken request that that we haven't quite given word to some we're not quite sure how to and sometimes it's just with groanings that we can really put those into into prayer what we'll ask is we keep these things in our in our prayers um, and right now we're going to enter into some silence and we'll pray and then we'll conclude that time with the Lord's Prayer and one of the powerful things about the Lord's Prayer in the ancient world the early Christians would pray this prayer three times a day morning noon and night at the times when most Jewish people would have been praying in the day as well the understanding was even if they weren't together to pray it they were praying it together at the same time and there was a sense of connection and unity in that in the same way it does that for us now while we are separated in our worship we are united in our prayer and our fellowship with God I invite you to time of silence Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we think about offering, I would remind you of these words. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Offerings can be sent, tithes, gifts, to Karen. She will make the necessary deposits. I know it's a strange way to do an offering, but, you know, this is what we have to do right now to keep everybody safe and healthy but I don't want you to think of your offering ending with that gift sent to Karen I want you to see each day as an offering each day as a gift of God to God and offer that gift through love of neighbor love of enemy and love of God 
seek to be a blessing. Our words of benediction are this from 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that you're in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Peace, friends. Have a marvelous time of worship today.